Well, thank you all. Um, good evening. Um, hot on the heels of the England football team who won um, to great excitement. I think we uh, would like to welcome you all to this, uh, to this uh, uh, presentation tonight. Um, Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, we, uh, we will try to shed some light on the, on the, the dark art of ultrasonography. And uh, we hope that you can uh, see some more shape in that, in that fuzzy gray pattern that you uh, may have seen before. Now, we will start with the presentation and, and then uh, at the end of the presentation, you know, uh, which will consist of some, some, some more sort of background information and some case studies, we will have the opportunity to ask some questions um, or answer some questions. Um, if you could please um, uh, type in the, the questions that you may have in the Q&A panel down the bottom of your screen, then we will um, select the questions and uh, answer those um, if there are any. Um, yeah, hopefully this will be a relatively brief um, lecture, so about 45 minutes or so, and then some, um, some time for questions at the end. So we hope to finish at about 8.15 or so. Um, thank you very much for, for attending uh, on behalf of all of us. And I would like to introduce um, yeah, my co-presenters, uh, Manon Fioretti, Lucy Carmichael, and Nuno Secura. Um, we are all sort of uh, part of, of course, of the veterinary team of Cliff Equine Vets, but with a particular interest in yeah, the orthopedic and sports medicine um, side of that. So um, without further ado, I uh, would like to start with this presentation. Thank you. So we have here just a little summary of what we will uh, what we will uh, um, um, show in this presentation. We will start with what is uh, what is the ultrasound, in fact, and also the different uh, uses of ultrasound, and then some clinical cases that uh, each one of us will will share with you, just to try to make you understand how uh, we can use ultrasound in in our clinical uh, cases. So first of all, what what is ultrasound? I think that is that is the first uh, question. It's um, um, it's so ultrasound. In fact, it's it's just like any other uh, sound wave. It's a mechanical wave that uh, propagates itself in, in in matter and like in contrast with uh, with uh, for example uh, light that it's a, an electromagnetic wave. Uh, so ultrasound needs matter to propagate, uh, and it's. Uh, uh, we, 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 we define ultrasound as being the range of, of, of wave uh, above what we can hear, so above 20,000 hertz. So hertz is the unit that measures the, the energy within, within the sound wave. Uh, anything above 20 hertz, 20,000 20, hertz, sorry, it's considered to be an ultrasound. Um, and... Um, we normally use we normally use much higher uh, uh, um, energies in this, so in the order of, in the order of millions. So normally uh, two million to to ten to fifteen million hertz, so ten megahertz. <coughs> so we are no pioneers in this technology. This this kind of technology has been used in nature for millions of years, actually. So since the 18th century, that we know that bats, for example, they use this kind of of. Uh, technology, let's say, uh, to uh, make a picture of their surrounding uh, by using the echoes uh, and by producing ultrasounds and receiving the echoes and making an, a, a picture in their brain of the surrounding. So what we did was to try to apply this, this uh, technology, let's say, uh, to, in, in order to uh, be able to understand deeper structures, okay? And to use it in the medical field to diagnose. To diagnose, um, this we, we we are able to do this because we found out that some crystals have a very interesting property, which is the piezoelectric effects. Which means that some crystals, when they have a, a mechanical stress, they produce an electric uh, potency, and the opposite is also true. So, an electric uh, th these same crystals, when they are uh, um, subjected to electro uh, electric uh, stimulation, they produce a vibration. And this vibration is the same proportion to the amount of energy that we, we put on them. So the probes that we use, we can, uh, 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 the probes that we use are made out, out of these crystals, okay? So human nowadays use ultrasound in three different 
let's say three, three different areas in sonars to detect, for example, fish in the ocean or, or initially to detect submarines. That was the first time we actually used ultra ultrasound was to detect submarines in the First World War. Uh, but also nowadays we use it very often in industrial uh, usage to, to, to detect defects on manufacture, uh, but also on, on medical devices uh, to, to diagnose. And that's what we're going to go more in depth here, obviously. So, like I was explaining, these are the transducers or the probes that we use in our uh, um, uh, ultrasounds. They're made out of these small crystals. So there's thousands of these crystals, hundreds of these, these crystals in the probes that send out uh, waves. Uh, and these waves can be either reflected, refracted, scattered, or absorbed. So the, the, the waves that are reflected are the echoes that we can actually then receive in the, in the, in the probe. Uh, and we can then see the image uh, as a dot uh, in our screen. The conjunction of a lot of these dots make an image, so a real-time image, image of the deeper structures. So when there is a, a boundary with, between two tissues, uh, there is this reflection, refraction, scatter or absorption of the waves, depending uh, on the interaction between the two uh, the two tissues. So the, it's called the impendence, which is actually the resistance that is present on the different layers of the tissue. For example, if we are, if we are doing an ultrasound of a, of a leg, we will have the skin, obviously the subcutaneous tissue, the tendon and so on. And these different tissues will have different properties and different densities, which will make the wave or be reflected or be refracted or be scattered. And sometimes also absorbed, but that's a minority. And, and this is something we cannot see on the ultrasound. So what we see back is the is is the reflected uh, 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 echoes. Uh, the scatter sometimes we can see, but they normally contribute to uh, uh, to what we call artifacts. So it's sometimes it's uh, it makes interpretate it interpreting the image a little bit more tricky if we have a lot of scattering. Um, the great advantage of of, uh, of ultrasound is uh, we can actually produce a real time image of deeper structures. It's non invasive and it has really no secondary effects, like for example a CT or a radiography that has uh, um, radioactivity. Obviously, so it's it's a very benign uh, uh, um, procedure. Uh, we can go to the next one. So depending on the frequency. Uh, or, in, or on the energy that we uh, apply on these crystals, they will produce a different uh, uh, length of, of, uh, of, of wave. Uh, and, and depending on those frequencies, we can penetrate more or less. So low frequencies means that we can penetrate much deeper, uh, but that has a sacrifice and that is resolution. So for example, in the abdomen, we intend to see deeper structures, obviously, because we want to see the guts uh, which are obviously deeper than uh, a tendon, for example, uh, uh, or, uh, um, or for example, the liver or the kidneys. So they are deeper structures, so we need a high penetration. But that means that we have less of a quality of an image. When we are, uh, when we, when we are scanning more superficial structures, we can see much better, uh, so much, much higher resolution. Um, but we cannot see as we cannot see as in depth, and then we use the higher frequencies. Okay, we can go for the next. All right, sorry, I unmute myself. So uh, I'm just going to talk about how to interpret the image. Um, so once we have this image on the screen, um, we have it in black and white. And so, as Nino said, depending on the composition of the different tissue and the structures, um, the color will be uh, in different shade of gray. So that uh, ends the title. So I just choose this image because I think maybe most, uh, well, not most, but more, most of you have the chance to be a bit more familiar with uh, this image of uh, like baby. Um, so 
basic, basically what you see is um, the tissue will reflect those uh, waves and the more it reflects, the whiter it's going to be. So what's called echogenicity is just the ability to reflect these, uh, these waves, these ultrasound waves. So for example, the bone, uh, it's a very uh, dense structure. It's going to reflect all the, ultras all the waves and we're going to see a uh, white a uh, white uh, color. So we can see here the ribs of the baby and also like the here, the, the head, the, for, the, the forehead here. Um, and now if we go on the other side, so the, the black structure, well, the black is the fluid. So the fluid is not reflecting any wave. So we don't have any signal and it's just a black like this. Um, so for example, fluids, we can have, uh, it can be present in um, in a blood vessel in the in the heart, well in the cavity of the heart it can be in the abdomen in the thorax so we have quite a lot of, of place where there is fluid and we can see it with the ultrasound because it's uh, it's black like this uh, same in the joint so we, if we have a clear fluid in the joint it's going to be black um, and then uh, on the other side, so the bone, uh, we can also have calcification or um, mineralization. It's gonna, we're going to see it also white. There is one exception is with the air. So the air will be also white because it doesn't uh, it reflect all of it. Um, so yeah, if we have, for example, a wound and there is air penetration in the subcutaneous, we're going to see like little dots, uh, little white dots. And then we have the soft tissue. So this is going to be different shades of gray, depending on their composition. For example, a spleen will be a bit brighter than a liver. And um, we're going to, so basically if a, if, um, if a stroke, well, if, a, for example, the liver is brighter, brighter than it should be, we're going to say that it's hyper echoic. If it's darker than it should be, we're going to say that it's hypoechoic. I'm just introduced those terms because it's the one we use. And it's also, uh, yeah, we're just going to use it after in the clinical case. So it's just to let you know when we compare something, it's if it's more or more than normal, it's going to be hyperechoic. And if it's less than dar darker than normal, it's going to be hypoechoic. So that's more or less how we read the colors. And then we also need to do several plans. So the image we've got on the screen is in two dimension. So uh, the problem is in the body, the structure are in three dimensions. So to have this, this 3D image in our head, we need to do uh, two planes, so perpendicular planes. And we're going to start with uh, the longitudinal plane. So I took a leg just because I think it's quite, uh, maybe it's the easiest to visualize visualize it so if we cut if we put the probe in vertical it means that we're going to cut the leg uh, in in its length um, and we're going to obtain this kind of image so normally it's the other side but it's just for you to understand uh, in vertical um, how it is so here you have so this is all the tendon so this is a superficial deep accessory ligament and suspensory ligament. And this is the bone, this white structure here. So it's corresponds here to, to the structure we have uh, on the leg. Um, so this uh, longitudinal plane, if you imagine a cylinders and you just cut it in its length, what you see is like a rectangle. And that's what we see here, this rectangular shape is just because we cut this cylinder in, in, in its length. And now um, if we go on a transverse plane, we're going to cut the leg in horizontal. And if we cut the cylinder in horizontal, the area we're going to see is a circle. So that's what we see here. So this is a superficial, but this time in transverse. And we see that this is a circle. And here it's, the rect it's like a rectangle. So that's just two different view to um, to just describe, uh, well, just to understand a bit better the whole picture of um, of the well of the structure we are uh, scanning. And now I'm going to give. Uh, I'm going to let Lucy with the use of ultrasound. Yeah, perfect. So um, Nuno has briefly touched on the fact that ultrasound is used widely in medical investigations, and I think it's relatively well known that we use it widely in orthopedic investigations, hence why it's the main focus of our presentation today. 
Um, because of the way that ultrasound works, as um, Nuno and Manon have described, um, ultrasound is really useful um, for examination of soft tissue structures um, from an orth orthopaedic perspective. And you may well be quite familiar with the um, image on the right hand side of the screen here, um, which shows a transverse view, so a cut through view, as Manon's just been talking about, of the tendons at the back of the limb, um, which are all shown in great detail with ultrasound. What you might be less aware of is that ultrasound is also used in orthopaedic workups um, to examine bony surfaces. You might think that we just use x-rays to look at those, but actually using ultrasound is also very beneficial. We can also use it to investigate back and pelvic issues, um, and also to look at possible fractures, and even for the full investigation of wounds as well. So if we move to the next slide. Um, further to this, moving slightly away from the orthopedic topic, um, but we can also use um, ultrasound um, for abdominal and thoracic workups. This might be if we've seen a weight loss case or a colic. Um, we can also use it in respiratory investigations, whether it's just a mild asthmatic case or a severe pneumonia, ultrasound can help us fully evaluate the lungs. And the image on the left-hand side um, is a picture of some lungs here. The bright white lines heading straight downwards, they're known as comet tails, and they indicate that there's been disruption to the lung surface. Um, we can also use ultrasound to look for and evaluate abdominal thoracic masses, um, and that can be very useful because there's not many other ways that we can actually look at those. Um, so it's also widely used in equine reproductive medicine. Um, this extends from routine health assessments to examination for artificial insemination, where mares are scanned on a very regular basis in order to maximise the chances of them becoming pregnant. Um, and of course, like with people, we use it widely in pregnancy diagnosis as well. Um, the final alternative use of ultrasound that I'm just going to briefly cover, because it does step slightly away from the orthopaedic side, um, is in cardiac medicine. And we can use ultrasound to fully assess the heart in this image on the right hand side. Um, and also, um, so we can use this uh, when you might maybe picked up a murmur or an arrhythmia when you've been listening with a stethoscope or a normal clinical exam. We can then come back with an ultrasound and fully evaluate exactly what's going on and assess any implications of that. Equally, it can also be used to look at um, peripheral blood clots um, in vessels. Um, as you can see in this lower image here, you've actually got a, your nice tubular blood vessel with its valve on the right hand side of the image at the far end and the clot which is obstructing the vein in this case. So yeah. Um, so we're now just going to run you through some clinical cases and scenarios to demonstrate how ultrasound is used in our everyday veterinary work. Um, I've already said that we use ultrasound extensively in orthopaedic cases, but I'll just explain how it would fit in with your with an average lameness investigation. So lameness investigations will always start with a thorough clinical examination. We'll identify any initial areas of interest. For example, if we've got an area that's particularly swollen or warm, it might influence our decision making. And from there, we'll then move on to um, performing dynamic evaluation of the horse, where we'll closely observe their movement. Following this, it's likely we'll choose to um, perform some diagnostic analgesia, which is probably more commonly known to everyone as nerve blocks, where we inject local anaesthetic into particular areas in order to numb them and isolate the lameness to a specific region. Um, so once we've isolated the lameness and located the source of pain, um, we can then perform imaging, which may involve x-rays, ultrasound, and possible referral for MRI, CT, and bone scan, which is also known as scintigraphy. Um, so I'm just going to run through a couple of cases now, which will hopefully show why after x-rays um, were initially taken, performing additional ultrasound imaging was really invaluable in the diagnosis. So the first case involves a thoroughbred gelding who presented to us with a significant right hind limb lameness. Um, he was positive to flexion of the lower right hind limb as well. Um, so we performed a thorough lameness investigation with him um, and then decided to take some Im images. So we did some x-rays of the right hind um, fetlock region, which showed a small, almost circular area of bone loss um, in the outer sesamoid bone. And the sesamoid bones are the bones that just lie at the back of the fetlock. Um, and this little area of bone loss can be shown by, as can be seen with the red arrow just um, on the screen there. Um, because of this finding, we then decided to perform an ultrasound scan in order to fully evaluate the area. So on the right hand side of the screen again, you can see a transverse ultrasound image, like we've cut straight through the leg at the level shown by the red box on the left hand side. 
If you look at the ultrasound, we have the outer sesamoid bone, so the lateral sesamoid bone um, on the left hand side of the image, which looks quite abnormal, and the inner um, medial sesamoid bone on the right hand side, which has a more normal appearance. So we'll just pop to the next slide and we can take a slightly closer look at this. Um, so the image on the right um, is a much more normal appearance of the sesamoid bones with a ligament known as the intersesamoidian ligament running between them. We describe this more normal appearance as looking a bit like a seagull, so it almost looks like it's got its wings outstretched um, in front of you. You can sort of visualise that to just use a bit of imagination. Um, and on the left hand side, you can see the irregularity of the damaged sesamoid bone on the left. Um, it looks like the seagull's wing is sort of broken, um, and that's due to the bony disruption which has occurred in this case. Um, we've also got some disruption of the intersesamoidian ligament as well, and that's known as desmitis. Um, so you can see here on the x-ray, it looks sort of like a very small area of change, it wasn't particularly obvious. And then here we've got quite dramatic change seen on the imaging. Um, you can see the real contrast between what's more normal and what the, um, and what the damage is. Um, and without ultrasound imaging, we never would have known the full extent of this bone damage um, or that there was soft, associated soft tissue injury as well. So knowing all of this led to a diagnosis of bone loss where the intersesamoidian ligament inserted onto the sesamoid bone, so the back bones of the fetlock, um, associated bony debris and intersesamoidian ligament desmitis, so just inflammation of that um, intersesamoidian ligament. Um, and we were able to advise the client of appropriate treatment options in order to maximize the horse's um, chances of achieving full athletic recovery. So I just also wanted to quickly run through another case um, where we use ultrasound to further our investigation of a lump. So I'm sure everybody knows that horses are found with lumps and bumps relatively frequently. Um, and it's often very hard to accurately determine whether this lump is just soft tissue, whether it's a hematoma, an abscess, a seroma, so just full of fluid, um, and the list goes on really. Um, that's great, thank you, Randall. Um, so in this case, um, a seven-year-old gelding presented to us with a lump on the inside of his right fore radius. Now the radius is the bone just above the knee in the forelimb and it's outlined in this lovely picture of a painted horse um, in that red circle. The lump was slowly increasing in size, um, so um, really wanted to know what was going on. Um, and the horse was bright and comfortable in himself and he had no lameness associated. So we started off by just taking some x-rays, which found that a smooth oval shaped lump um, on the inside of the, uh, of the radius. It had some fine gritty material in it, um, which we wanted to further investigate, check whether there any soft tissue structures were involved, whether um, there was any bony involvement as well. So we then decided to perform an ultrasound, which showed that the mass was walled off from other structures. It was separate to the vein um, and it was filled with both gritty mineral deposits and fluid, which we can see on the next slide. So if we look at this slide um, and sort of remember the tips that Manon gave for um, what you were seeing, those dark areas that we can see um, are fluid just there. And then you've got some bright areas, which are the very gritty mineral material. Down at the bottom of each image, you have the bone surface, which is linear delineated with that sort of bright white line. And you can see that in both transverse and longitudinal planes so that you can see the mass is sort of just sort of right next door to that bone area. Um, but it did enable us to establish that it wasn't invasive, it wasn't going into the bone and it wasn't going into any other structures as well and sort of form a very thorough um, idea of exactly where the mass was and what it was doing. So because ultrasound enabled us to do that, we were then able to take the horse to surgery, fully remove the mass um, very safely and send it off for further investigations. So um, hopefully that was helpful knowing um, a bit more about ultrasound and I'm going to pass over to Manon who's going to discuss accessory ligament desmitis. Okay, so now we're going to see a typical case of uh, tendon. So the horse presented an acute uh, onset of uh, severe lameness uh, during exercise. So it just started to be very lame, uh, yeah, just, just hacking. Um, he presented the lameness on his right front and he was uh, reluctant to wait bare on, his, on this leg. Um, so on examination, we could see that the, 
the back of the leg, so the palmar aspect of the metacarpus was hot, swollen and painful on palpation. So as you can see in those two images, so this image, you see that the, the tendon are not swollen and is in normal shapes. And here you see that there is this um, area of swelling all over the tendon at the back of the leg. So this is quite, um, this is quite indicative, indicative of tendon or ligament injury in this area. So just to remind um, the difference uh, between tendonitis and desmitis. So if it touch a tendon, it's a tendonitis. If it's touch a ligament, it's a desmitis. And in this area at the back of the, the metacarpus, we have the superficial digital flexor tendon, the deep digital flexor tendon, the accessory ligaments to the deep digital flexor tendon. It's also known as check ligaments. And this one just fuse, um, just fuse more or less at uh, mid uh, heights of the cannon bone. And then we also have the suspensory ligament, which is like close to the, the closest to the bone. So with, um, with the, the shape of the swelling, we can have an idea of uh, which tendon is um, touched. So for example, if you have a really big area at the back of the leg, a big swell, swell, swelling at the back of the leg, uh, like banana shape, it could be uh, more indicative of, of superficial digital flexor tendon injury. If you have a swelling more on the side of the leg, it could be more an accessory ligament, but this is, um, uh, this is not always the case. If we see that in this in this uh, leg, everything is just very swollen everywhere, so it's a bit difficult to just um, uh, determine where is the problem with um, just the swelling. And also, same with the palpation. Palpation was it was very painful everywhere on this leg, and it was a bit difficult to find a, like an area of pain and to define the tendon. So we went for ultrasound and what the ultrasound we uh, helps to confirm the diagnostic also to localize and fully describe the lesion and also to monitor the recovery and adapt the rehabilitation so um, first to confirm the lesion uh, well the diagnostic so this is a typical uh, image of a tendon so this was taken just above um, the carpus and we can see here so this is a superficial digital flexor tendon, this is the deep digital flexor tendon, the accessory ligament or the check ligament and the suspensory ligament with here the bone. And we can see here that all the, like the shapes are um, quite regular. There is quite an homogeneity in, in all the, in the color pattern. And then when we go more down, so this is more down and this is again more down. When we go more down, we start to see a region a bit more, uh, a bit hypoechoic here. And especially here, you can see that there is a disruption in the color and in the pat in the fiber pattern. So that's the lesion. So we confirm the, the, the lesion here. Also just to, uh, if, just to uh, if you're not aware, so the, accessory ligament is progressively fusing with the dip and here we see that it's almost it's like mid um, mid cannon bone and we see that it's almost fused so it was a bit difficult to fully understand if the accessory ligament was uh, the problem if the dip was a problem or if there were a lesion in both um, uh, in both uh, structure with just this image so I just went a little bit more in the side, on the lateral side, and we could see here, so this is the superficial, we cannot really see it, but it's there. We have the deep flexor tendon here and the accessory ligament here. And we can see that the border of the deep digital flexor tendon is uh, very uh, well defined. And the problem is more on the accessory ligament. So we have like an heterogeneous, heterogeneous um, area here. Um, compatible with the lesion. So with this ultrasound, we could say that the, um, the lesion was on um, the accessory ligament. So it was accessory ligament desmitis. And actually, um, yeah, prognosis of accessory ligament are, is normally better than um, a deep digital flexor tendon. So it's always yeah, useful to know exactly where is the lesion. Um, and now I also, we also did a longitudinal, longitudinal view of this just to evaluate, um, well, fully evaluate the lesion. So those little 
white, uh, bright, uh, straight line here are the fibers. So this is a normal fiber pattern here. And you can see there is still fibers in there and a bit in this side, but in the middle, everything is uh, a bit more hypoechoic, so a bit more black. So this is the region of, uh, of the lesion. So there is a disruption of the fiber pattern. And in this case, there is almost no more fiber pattern in there. So do, doing um, a longitudinal view like this, so this, this side is up to, well, there is a carpus in there, and this other side there is, uh, it's towards the foot. So we could just measure how long was the lesion, and it was like a 10 centimeter lesion on uh, with the other side. So yeah, with this slide uh, on the lateral side of the, the accessory ligament. So yeah, with ultrasound, we could fully describe the lesion and um, we could also um, have a better idea of the prognosis based on the, the extent of the lesion and how much tendon was uh, left. So we can see that there is like maybe like a third or almost half of the tendon disrupted. Um, so it just yeah, really helped to uh, describe the lesion and not just saying that it was a tendonitis or a desmitis. Um, this is also a nice view to inject. If we need to inject some medication, we can inject straight in the lesion because we see it very well. I will not develop this because Nuno you know, will uh, will do it after. Um, and then to monitor the recovery and the rehabilitation. So here we can see the lesion hypoechoic here, and three months later there is a nice um, hyperechoic region here. So this is the scar tissue. Um, so the, in general, the, um, the image is a bit brighter, so it's not exactly the same image in the same setting, but uh, just for you to have an idea of uh, how it looks after, um, and it's just filled with new, um, new um, fibers and, bone, uh, and scar tissue. And it's really helpful uh, to decide if uh, the horse and the tendon is ready to uh, load more, uh, well, not more weight, and if we can restart uh, progressively work. Um, especially on uh, accessory ligaments, they sound really, uh, they are sound really quickly, but it doesn't mean the tendon is ready to load um, and to support the tension. So that's why the ultrasound is really helpful because we can fully. Uh, know if the tendon is uh, uh, strong enough to uh, support weight and to introduce the trot or even to introduce canter, it's a good uh, it's a good control before going for the next step. So yeah, just to conclude, the ultrasound for investigating tendon helps to confirm the di diagnostic, but to understand better the pathology and have a better idea of the prognosis and the accurate pro prognosis. We can have more treatment option and also a better follow-up of the healing with a uh, possibility to adapt the rehabilitation protocol, protocol to uh, well, what we see with ultrasound. Now I'll leave, uh, I pass to Nuno. Can you? Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Okay, so now I'm going to um, go through a little bit of uh, ultrasound guided injections, which is something we also use quite frequently, and it's one of the great tools that ultrasound gave us. And uh, this, one of the, the advantages of doing ultrasound guided injections is really to be able to direct uh, any um, medication or um, sample collection to the site that we intend. So the advantage is to increase the precision in delivering that medication, uh, to increase also the specificity, meaning that we can more accurately uh, do a nerve block, for example, especially blocks that we don't do as frequently or blocks that are a bit, or nerves that are, that are a bit more deep and we cannot palpate them superficially. Uh, with with uh, using uh, um, the ultrasound to guide us, it's it's uh, it's it's gives us much more accuracy and confidence that we are actually blocking the nerve. Um, you've probably seen nerve blocks in any, in in any uh, orthopedic examinations you've had in the past, um, so uh, it's it's really putting a little bit of local anesthesia. Uh, around the nerve in order to see if the pain is coming from a specific location. Uh, in some areas, these nerves are a bit deeper. By using the ultrasound, we can guide the needle into the right place and be sure that we are actually blocking the right, the right nerve. Uh, it also reduces the risk of uh, an inadvertent uh, injection on pu or puncture. 
uh, let's, I can give you an example. For example, if you're doing an, an abdominal uh, um, uh, fluids, uh, so if you want to take some peritoneal fluid from the abdomen, uh, we want to avoid puncturing the guts or the spleen, for example. So we can use the ultrasound to guide us to see where there's a bit of a pocket of fluid where we can easily take some. Uh, we can easily take a sample. Um, it also uh, um, so there's some sites or some joints that can only be medicated uh, reliably by using ultrasound because they are small. Uh, structures and they are deep structures as well so we have really to direct the needle into the right place by using the, the ultrasound otherwise most of the times we are probably not in the right place uh, so there's here a study that i show you there and highlighted in 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 uh, yellow uh, and it's this this in this case it's a it's a, a tubule nerve block uh, which is a block that we perform quite frequently in the hinds in the hind limbs uh, and uh, if you don't do it ultrasound guided, sh studies have shown that less than than half of the times uh, you are in the right place. So probably 50% or less than 50% is actually 47.6% of the times you're actually not blocking the right the right structure. So using the ultrasound is really important in these cases to make sure that we are uh, we are actually. Uh, blocking the structure we intend and there's really no disadvantage of, of using this technique uh, the only one would be obviously it's a bit more time consuming and you have to have an ultrasound but otherwise there's no reason not and uh, not to use it really and you can see here the image on the right as well uh, which illustrates a bit what we do so we put the probe uh, into uh, on, on the skin uh, and then we direct the needle uh, on top of the probe uh, having the objects uh, in the in the in the beam, so in the in the area where we're scanning, and then we direct the needle towards that object. Um, I think it's pretty clear on the image. So, what when do we use it more frequently? So like I said, in deep joints, so SI joints, for example, so the sacroiliac joints, facet joints as well. Uh, stifle is also a good a good indication uh, for the perineal analgesia, so for the blocks, like we said. Uh, for intralesional injections, like Manon's case, uh, it's always a good one because we can see where the injury is and then we can direct uh, the needle into that injury and medicate the sites <clears throat> with a great precision. And especially nowadays that we're using more and more regenerative therapies, which are pretty expensive as well. They're very good and there's a lot of beneficial effects to it, but we want to make sure that we are uh, injecting uh, those medications in the right sites. So doing that with the ultrasound, it can be really advantages to take the best outcome out of those therapies and have the best healing. Uh, we also use it for sample collection. So like biopsies or for uh, draining abscesses, for example, uh, or to have some synovial fluids. So some fluid from the joints, if we need to, if we need to see if there's any infection on the joint, for example. So these are all uses that are, that we do uh, with with ultrasound guided. <clears throat> In this case, here I have an example of a sacroiliac uh, a sacroiliac joint injection. Probably you've you've uh, have had your horse. Uh, injected uh, with this uh, in, in this joint. It's quite a frequent a frequent site of of, uh, of problems in horses, uh, and it's a joint that is protected. So you can see here in yellow the the ilium. Uh, so on number three is the tubercoxi, uh, number one is the wing of the ilium, and number two is this the the tuber sacrale. Uh, and then here in green uh, we can see the positions where we can put the probe. So the the ultrasound. Uh, in order to try to be as close as possible to that joint. So the joint is, if you see on the picture on the right, is number four. This is the sacroiliac joint. I hope that, so hopefully that is, <laughs> that is clear. So we can see here also the bone four, which is the sacrum. So the connection between the yellow and the, the white bone, the bone four, it's the sacroiliac joint, okay? And we can see that the joint is actually covered by the ilium. So we cannot see the, 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 the joint directly. So we have to make sure that we, 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 we are able to be parallel uh, to the ilium in order to actually uh, inject the joint or be as close to the joint as possible for this injection to be successful. So doing this blindly, we can pass the image, please, Mano. So you can see as well that it's, it is quite deep, right? So there's the big, 
uh, gluteus muscle there. It's one, it's one of the biggest muscles of the body. It's quite quite uh, big big muscle and it's 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 quite deep. So we have to use a pretty big needle. So any change in in the angle can uh, alter dramatically. So within probably if you change millimeters in the position of the needle, it will change it will change several centimeters. Uh, the place where you're injecting because it's quite far away, right? Uh, so it's important if you don't do it to sign guided, the, the risk of it not being in the space that we intend is really quite high. Uh, and also because it's protected by the bone, as you can see in the picture in the left, you can see here the, the ilium, which is cut uh, transversely here, uh, it's protecting the joints. So you have really to put the needle parallel to that bone in order to be into the joints and that is pretty much i wouldn't say impossible but it's difficult to do without without ultrasound okay so here we have the example in the movie so you can see on the on the on the green arrow you can see that there's a a, a white line and that is the needle coming exactly between the sacroiliac joints you can see here the two bones and the joint there so you can then see the needle in the right place and and then you you know that you're in the place you want to inject whatever treatment you're doing or we are doing in this case okay i have here another example which is the tibial nerve block <clears throat> and uh, as you can see so just to describe quickly here the anatomy i don't want to go into too much detail but so the tibial nerve is a nerve localized on the hind limbs and by blocking this nerve we can act so by putting local anesthesia in this nerve, we can exclude any pain coming or most uh, of the distal, so the, 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 the pain that is coming from the hock and, and below. Um, sometimes we have to add the peroneal uh, as well, but uh, most of the cases, the tibial is enough to block, to, to, to exclude uh, our doubts of having pain uh, of, the, of the distal limb. So anything below below the hook. Uh, so what we do is we insert a bit of local anesthesia in number one, if you can see the picture in the left or in the right as well with the ultrasound. So number one uh, is the tibial nerve. And just next to it, you have one branch of the saphenas, which is number two. And you have here the tendons, number three and four. And, and then you have a deeper muscle here, number seven, uh, which is uh, also has a fascia on top. This number seven. <clears throat> is the lateral deep flexor tendon. So you can see how, pro how, how, how close number one and the muscle are. So if you are just a little bit too deep, it's very easy. So it's a matter of millimeters. You can be inside uh, the muscle uh, and, uh, uh, and it, this will mean that you potentially we won't be able to, to uh, uh, put the local anesthesia in the place that we intend. By doing it with the ultrasound, as you can see here in the video, so you can see here on the right, the needle coming, and you can see here a black pocket that is forming. And that is the local anesthesia that is being put around. You can see the cylindric uh, structure, that is, which is the nerve. And you can see deeper that there's the muscle. So we are now sure that the local anesthetic is actually around the nerve and not too deep uh, inside the muscle. So this is beneficial because we are sure that the block has been well placed. And we can we can confidently uh, exclude any pain coming from uh, below, uh, for, where from any any structure that this nerve uh, uh, innervates. Um, so this is this can be very very useful in this sense. And I'll leave it now to to Edward. Thank you. Um, yeah, I also wanted to. Um highlight uh, the possibilities and, uh, and extra information we can um, get with ultrasonography on horses presenting with back pain. Um, my case here is a horse that presented with uh, bucking when asked to canter. You can see that picture there, quite uncomfortable for the rider. And uh, on further examination of the, this horse's back, we found that uh, the horse is quite sensitive to the touch and, and very unwilling to to, to flex the back sideways. We did some x-rays and this showed some, some evidence of mild kissing spines, but nothing that would maybe uh, yeah, completely explain why this horse is behaving in this way. So to further evaluate the back, we uh, performed an ultrasonography. Um, 
just to yeah go quickly over the anatomy of the back um, i always say that you know you always look at kissing spines and and you know which are formed by the dorsal spinous processes uh, but I always feel that these are only the tip of the iceberg. That's the bit that, that you can easily see. There's a lot of structures. There are a lot of structures there that we can't uh, see unless we look further and deeper. Uh, amongst these are the articular facet joints. These are the facet joints uh, that um, are between the individual uh, vertebral bodies of the, of the thoracic and lumbar spine. Uh, we have the lumbar sacral joint, which is the the, the junction between the lumbar spine and the, and the sacrum, which is the roof of the pelvis. And we have the sacroiliac joints, which are already uh, highlighted by Nuno as well. Next slide, please. So particularly um, on the facet joints of this horse, uh, we felt that um, on, on presenting and we're looking at the, at the normal picture down the bottom, bottom left here, where we can see uh, the, the shape of the spine as we see on the on the top left picture, you can see the dorsal spinous process in the center, and then we can see the multifidus muscle just adjacent to the dorsal spinous process. And this is actually a composite image. So it's actually both the right hand side and the left hand side stick stuck together into one picture. But on the top left, you can see the one-sided picture, which highlights the dorsal spinous process, then the facet joint, and then the musculature surrounding that. In the center picture on the top, you can actually see one of the, the, the segments that would highlight some arthritis of the facet joints. This basically uh, gives you a very sort of irregular bone surface, a bone pattern that sometimes I refer to as a, as a cauliflower-like cauliflower structure. That's almost what it looks like, but it's really that irregular shape that we are looking for in an ultrasound picture. So if we now look at that bottom right picture, on the left-hand side of the picture, we can see that on that facet joint, there is an irregular bone pattern and also it is asymmetrical. So the, the picture on the left hand side is not equal to the picture on the right hand side. So that mean, meant that this horse was diagnosed with um, uh, arthritis of the facet joints. So we have, a, um, as part of the, the treatment options for um, facet joint arthritis, we can again um, inject this with um, with some uh, medication, quite often some steroids. And again, to be able to do this uh, accurately, particularly when we are injecting into the deeper structures, it is good to do this under ultrasound guidance. So we can see where that needle is going and uh, really enables us to, to deposit the medication in exactly the right spot. So we see the needle coming down and we can really guide it to exactly the right spot. And then we, we make sure that it is in the right spot in the joint and we can deposit some medication which we can hopefully see in a moment. You can see it flowing through the needle. You can see it there now. That is when we inject that area and we can see that the fluid actually moving through the needle and into that joint. So here it comes again. That's it, coming down, making sure we're exactly in the right spot and then injecting into the joint. So this again, this highlights the the, the area where ultrasound can be really beneficial in evaluating yeah, deeper structures of the back that are not normally uh, visualized by, say, more conventional x-rays, which would only highlight the more sort of superficial structures. Uh, thank you very much. So that was this little case here. Um, so yeah, we have had the opportunity to, um, to enter some questions in um, in the in the Q and A section, I'm not sure if there's any questions there, or if any other people have any questions they want to ask, then please um, enter your question in the Q and A section, please. I will just check the, the first one. And um, Lot is asking: uh, When a horse has an injury to the ligament in the leg, will they always show lameness? I think that's a very good question. Um, they don't always do that, so. I know of cases that um, have an, an injury, particularly when they have, uh, say, for instance, a check ligament injury, the, 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 the injury that uh, Manon described uh, this evening. And um, quite often, maybe they have a short-term lameness, but then quite often they, they become uh, quite comfortable quite quickly afterwards. Um, that actually has quite a... a, a, a is actually a good indicator of how well this horse is going to do later on because the, the more sound they are in the start, the, the more likely they are to, to come back you know, into full work. 
particularly the ones that are sort of consistently lame, maybe have a slightly sort of um, uh, worse prognosis. But so, uh, yeah, I can definitely think of, of, of uh, horses that have injured uh, ligaments or tendons that maybe don't show lameness or maybe only show lames on very particular circumstances. So that's definitely uh, something to consider and also to um, take into your um, consideration when you are formulating a prognosis so, or the time scale for this horse to come back into full work. Thank you. I don't have any other open questions at the moment. So are there any other questions that people want to ask? Just gonna keep that open. Um, oh, there's another question coming up. Um, where can I get a recording of the lecture? Um, Adam asks, um, not sure actually. So we're gonna, um, I'll, I'll, I'll refer to my uh, the technical assistance here and then making sure we get, uh, we get a recording uh, put up or sent to you. Thank you. Oh, and another one here another from one, Maretta. Yeah. yeah. Um, from what angle direction do you ultrasound the SR joint to visualize it? And from what angle direction do you inject? Again, another good question. So um, the SI joint is normally visualized um, from, from underneath. So actually per rectum. So we do a, a rectal um, examination where uh, we look uh, with the ultrasound probe upwards to see uh, the area of uh, the joint and particularly um, it's on the back end of the of the, the caudal end of the sacroiliac joint that you see most changes and that is something that we can uh, really see on an ultrasound scan we can actually compare the right hand side to the left hand side and that will enable us to tell whether or not there is any changes there in that joint now because that joint is so wide and and quite long it's um the fact that you maybe not see any changes on the back of that joint doesn't mean that there is maybe no discomfort coming from that joint. So it's, it's quite a difficult structure to see fully because it's so well enveloped by other parts of the, of the skeleton, by the bone and by the musculature. But um, we particularly evaluate that structure so from underneath. But yeah, any sort of access that needs to be done from, uh, from the top end, so from... Um, through the skin and then uh, injecting downwards because we can't inject through the rectum but that would mean that we had uh, contamination of the needle with, uh, with with bacteria from the from the from the from the fecal matter and that would yeah uh, basically seed an infection into the deeper structures so it is definitely not what we want to do so we would always um, approach that from the outside but it's the sacroiliac joint is best visualized from the inside uh, Good recording. Um, let me see. Um, will a horse that has a ligament or tendon injury always be weaker where there is scar tissue? So, uh, you know, scar tissue is a funny thing that uh, it actually is quite strong, and it's um, and it's um, you know its purpose is to you know pull all the 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 injured parts together and make it sort of whole again. So scar tissue itself is actually very strong and probably even stronger than, than normal tendon or ligament tissue. The problem lies in the fact that um, if you look at an ultrasound scan, the um, uh, scar tissue is, 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 is a tissue that is growing in all directions because it's basically trying to grab all the bits of tissue together and, 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 and get it back together again. It does mean that, uh, that, that scar tissue is very, you know, is, is, is fibers that are growing in all sort of haphazard directions. And for tendon or ligament injury, uh, for tendon or ligament tissue, we like that um, uh, all those fibers to be in the same direction. So that's uh, where it mo has most elasticity and where it's then most functional because there's always a little bit of stretch in, in those structures. So where, what we see um, in a ligament or tendon that is injured that the scar tissue is strong, and rarely is it re-injured, but what we see is that um, actually the tissue or the ligament um, adjacent to that scar tissue is then much more vulnerable to repeat injury. So we see um, actually a repeat injury quite often on, on a slightly different location than the original injury because the scar tissue is quite strong, but it does affect the overall elasticity of the tendon or ligament and therefore has a risk of repeat injury for sure. Um, oh, another one here. Can we use this webinar as CPD? Um, 
not sure. I think we can maybe ascribe uh, certain points to that. I'm sure we can. Um, I think it's, I think I, I, I can award um, one hour CPD by now. Thank you. Egbert, we have another question, but in discussion. Oh. Can all ultrasound imaging be undertaken on the yard or do horses have to go to your hospital? Um, so I think most most can be done on the yard. I think uh, from probably for um, safety reasons, uh, certain investigations like the, the internal scans, you know, the rectal scans for say sacroiliac joint disease or lumbosacral joint disease, um, are uh, maybe better or safer done in, in, in the stock. So I think that's where we maybe prefer these to be undertaken in, in, at the hospital. Um, quite often also is that they are followed on or the evaluation of the ultrasound is quite often not done on its own, but is, is combined with x-rays or with nerve blocks, etc. And then it's again, uh, sometimes easier to have those cases in the clinic or in the hospital. But I think there is a you know, definitely uh, a lot of examinations with ultrasound can be done in the yard and actually that's the, the nice thing of it is that um, because most of our machines are portable and battery operated um, they they make for a very useful tool in the field to to make a diagnosis but they have their limitations of course thank you no open questions I had one more comment or observation actually myself. It was when Lucy said I had to imagine the seagull when uh, when thinking of those sesame bones. And actually, then the injury looked like a seagull eating, scoffing a plate of chips. I think that's actually what it reminded me of at the Brighton Pier. So there you go. It's uh, imagination at work. Um, yeah, I think I think that's it. Thank you all very much, and thank you uh, Manon, Lucy, and Nuno for uh, their eloquent presentations. Um, thank you all for for uh, attending this um, hopefully informative um, uh, session on ultrasound and um, yeah, we hope to see you in the near future hopefully for just routine work of course but not uh, but we're always there for emergencies if you need us thank you thank you very much thank you thank you have a good evening <laughs>